Good morning, everyone. Sorry about that. Wake you all up. How's everybody doing? Good? How's the conference so far? Like it? Good. All right, well, welcome. My name is Terry Clancy. I'm with the New Jersey Department of Health Office of EMS, and welcome to the 13th annual conference on EMS. Those of you here for credits are here, Dr. Commander Katora, or both. All right. Let me just get a, a few things out of the way here, and then I'm going to introduce Director Phelps here in a second. Commander Katora does not have any relevant financial relationships, product endorsements, sponsorship, or commercial support related to this presentation. Commander Katora does not intend to discuss any non-FDA approved or investigational use of any product or device. He or she will disclose any conflicts of interest, learning goals, and objectives for this presentation. This activity has been planned and implemented in accordance with the accreditation requirements and policies of the Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical Education through the New Jersey Academy of Family Physicians. The New Jersey Academy of Family Physicians is accredited by the ACCME to provide continuing medical education for physicians. The New Jersey Academy of Family Physicians designates this live activity for 1.5 AMA PRA Category 1 credits. Physicians should claim any only credit commensurate with the extent of their participation in the activity. Requirements for the successful completion of today's program, presence of the entire session, entire start to finish, not missing more than 10 minutes, participation in all learning activities, your ID must be scanned for the session, you must complete all session evaluation forms, nurses must sign in and out on the nurse attendance sheet, Mike Talent or Mike Riley in the back, so please see them when at the conclusion of the presentation. Nurses must complete a handwritten session evaluation form, and after completion, you will be provided a link to view and print your conference certificate. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Director Scott Phelps of the Office of EMS. Good afternoon, everybody. Good morning, still. I can't believe it's still morning. I feel like we've been up for three days already, right? Um, I'm here to introduce Commander Couture. Commander Couture is an emergency physician and an EMS physician stationed on board Marine Corps Base Camp Lejeune in Eastern North Carolina. He currently serves as the intern specialty leader in pre-hospital and disaster medicine for the Surgeon General of the United States Navy, the Navy Region Southeast Region EMS Medical Director, and the EMS Medical Director for Camp Lejeune Fire and Rescue. In addition, Commander Kotura is the resuscitation advisor for the Trauma Steering Committee of the Naval Medical Center, Camp Lejeune. He's a proud New Jersey resident. And the first question I asked him was, Taylor ham or pork roll? <laughs> pork roll. Second question I asked him was, sub, hero, or hoagie? Sub. He, he's not from Somerset County, we can tell. He's a proud resident of uh, East Brunswick, New Jersey. Um, an alumni of Richard Stockton State College, class of 2002 summa cum laude, as well as the University of Medicine and Dentistry School of Osteopathic Medicine. He completed his internship and residency in emergency medicine at Naval Medical Center Portsmouth in Norfolk, Virginia, and is a graduate, uh, an honors graduate of both programs, clearly an overachiever. He completed his fellowship in emergency medical services and disaster medicine at Newark Beth Israel Medical Center along with a master's in public health from Rutgers University in 2014. It is my great privilege to introduce Commander Kotura today, um, returning from Virginia to New Jersey to talk about trauma center systems and the integration of civilian and military healthcare. Commander Kotura. Thanks very much, sir. Uh, one question you didn't ask me was Wawa or 7-Eleven? The answer is going to be Wawa. <laughs> like all good EMS professionals, right, Wawa? So uh, before we begin, I'm going to give you my disclaimer. Uh, so this is my presentation alone. The military uh, has blessed it, but I don't speak on behalf of the military. So this is not Department of the Navy policy or Department of Defense. And also before we begin, Let's get a round of applause for the 22 million veterans who are celebrating Veterans Day today.
Any United States Marines in the audience right now? All right, stand up, please. So on behalf of, uh, of myself, uh, happy 242nd birthday today. You guys look pretty good for 242. <laughs> All right, so let's get right to it, straight no chaser. Why should you care about what I'm going to talk to you about? Here's a pretty good answer. 59 dead, 527 injured. Can your trauma system comfortably absorb 527 patients? How many trauma centers in New Jersey? The answer is not enough, right? The answer is always not enough. So it, whether it was 10, 5, 100, the answer is never enough because on a day-to-day -day base or basis with operations, uh, the routine trauma patient, motor vehicle accident, uh, gunshot wound, the stab wound, we can do just fine. When we have a crisis and we have a mass casualty scenario, there's never enough trauma care. So the answer is not have sub-specialized trauma centers, and that is a great answer for the routine basis, but there, the point of today's lecture is gonna be that trauma, like chest pain and like stroke, everybody has to have a buy-in. The chain of survival is as important for trauma as it is for STEMI and stroke and out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, and we're hoping that after today, you come away with some semblance of what we're trying to put down. I've been in the military now 15 years. I've been wearing the cloth of the nation for 15 and active duty 11. I've done a lot of important things. I've been a part of a lot of important projects. This is the most important thing I have ever done and will likely ever do in the military. So sooner or later, it's gonna come up that you guys are gonna have a mass casualty or a potential mass casualty from a violent incident. Oh wait, you already did. So here's a Marine Corps run, April of 2016, IED in a garbage can. How many casualties? Zero, why? Because the race started late. This was designed to detonate in the middle of the race, preferably when majority of the runners would have been children. This was gonna be a shock and awe. This was gonna be designed to hit you in the solar plexus because they wanted to not just inflict casualties, but also inflict terror. The same bomber detonated a device in Chelsea in a garbage or a dumpster, injuring 19. And then most recently on Halloween, we had a terrorist drive a uh, pickup truck down a bike path, killing eight, mostly folks who were visiting from other countries trying to enjoy everything that the tri-state area has to offer. 2015 to 2017, unprecedented number of complex terror attacks. When I say complex, that's bombs plus small arms fire, gunshot wounds. We saw it in San Bernardino. This was a disgruntled employee who also had some religious affiliation. We saw it at the Pulse nightclub in April of 2016, and we, we said, all right, we got this. We got a religion problem, right? It was easy to blame the religion. Well, then we had a sitting U.S. congressman take fire at a baseball practice that was supposed to be a charity game with multiple gunshot wounds to the abdomen and pelvis. And we were certain that this was going to be a religious problem. Nope, it was a middle-aged white guy who did not like the current establishment in the United States Senate and Congress. He had a bend. And then most recently we had this. Folks, it's not a religion problem. It's not a... Uh, ideology problem, it's not a political problem, it's an American problem. Right now, we choose to, dis to display our displeasure with people with bombs and guns, and we have become a culture of violence, and I don't see this turning anytime soon. I'm sure you would agree with me. I'm gonna show you two pictures. You're probably gonna recognize one of them. Does anybody recognize this picture? Yeah, this is the famous cowboy picture. So we see a traumatic amputation below the knee of this gentleman's lower extremity. I'm gonna show you another picture. This is from theater. This is not my picture, this is open source obtained from the internet because uh, I will not put my own pictures in, in these presentations. However, this is a traumatic amputation of the left lower extremity below the knee. If I take out all the subtleties, all the indicators to tell you where this is, like you know the talon stretcher here and this 
gentlemen in uh, BDUs. I take out all the reminders that this is a civilian uh, location. And I just transpose those two wounds together. Which one came from theater in Iraq or Afghanistan? Which one came from Boston? You can't tell. If I told you 10 years ago that you would routinely be dispatched or potentially could be routinely dispatched to a complex attack involving multiple IEDs and gunshot wounds with traumatic amputations and complex blast trauma, what would you say to me? You're crazy. If I told you that today, it wouldn't even, you wouldn't even blink. That's, that's where we are. National Academy of Sciences, a friend to EMS. Has anybody ever read 1966, Accidental Death and Disability, the uh, Neglected uh, Disease of Modern Society? That was the paper that got EMS on the map. That's where we actually got funding to create a uh, program to train folks in response to casualties, injuries on the uh, thoroughfares and the highways, mostly in the western, and then it creeps eastward as well. So they met in April of 2016. I'm going to show you pictures of text. They are pictures. Please do not read the text, just listen to what I have to say. I didn't want to adulter any of this. I wanted you to get it straight from the text so you know the sources that we are using uh, throughout this project because it's, a, it's important. The idea was that we have a tremendously valuable trauma system in the United States. We do great trauma care, and New Jersey is no exception. Um, however, far too many people don't have access to timely trauma care. And if you are unfortunate to not live within the metropolitan region of a trauma center, uh, you often experience delays. Who here works in Sussex County, Warren County, Cumberland County? What's your average transport for a trauma patient? Yep, that's 20 minutes too late, right? So the report says that we have to get more trauma centers and we have to uh, get timely access to transport. Well, what's military given you guys, the civilian world, in the last 15 years? Number one, we've given you tourniquets. Tourniquets worked out great. We've given tranexamic acid, right? Number needed to treat of 68. For every 68 trauma patients, we'll save one life with an infusion of one gram of TXA. And that may be over or underestimating. We may actually be able to achieve better results. We just have a hard time doing the studies because of the study design. Fresh whole blood. I know nobody in the United States is currently transfusing fresh whole blood as far as I know, but this is a routine practice and we're gonna talk about it during the uh, talk here about how, how valuable fresh whole blood is. And then lastly, freeze-dried plasma. Freeze-dried plasma is scheduled to come online from the FDA in 2020. This is, under, uh, this is currently being used in the Special Operations Committee as an investigational new drug. And we're gonna talk about freeze-dried plasma and how well it works. So these are two quotes directly from the National Academy of Sciences paper. And the point that I want to make is that this was the entire spectrum of trauma care. It wasn't just the trauma surgeon. It wasn't just the trauma center. It wasn't the trauma rehab. It was from point of injury all the way through to rehabilitation with the goal of returning every trauma patient back to society. It's not just about saving lives. It's about putting you back in as a functional member of society and giving you a quality of life after you've been resuscitated. And this is buy-in at every level, leaders at every level. So that includes pre-hospital leaders, directors, medical directors, administrators. Everybody has to buy into this, otherwise it doesn't work. How do we know that this is actually achievable? Stanley McChrystal, prior commanding general of the 75th Ranger Regiment, decided that he was gonna make everybody in his entire regiment TCCC certified regardless of their job. From a mechanic to a 11 Bravo rifleman to the medic. Why? Because for his casualties that were sustained, one in 20 or 5% was a medic. If the medic went down, the whole team went down. His success after that proved that zero preventable death is achievable. 32 injuries, I'm sorry, 32 deaths, none of them were preventable. They were all casualty inflicted that would have died on the table. So he achieved zero, zero percent. It's pretty remarkable. Here's the continuum of trauma care according to the National Academy of Sciences paper. This looks very similar to Project Lifeline, right? We have bystander care, or in the military, we call this self-aid or buddy aid. Then we have pre-hospital care. 
This is analogous to hopefully not care under fire, but tactical field care, IVs, airways. And we have hospital, and it's titled definitive care. Pay attention to that word definitive care all the way through rehabilitation and returning somebody back into society. What's, the, what's definitive care to mean to you? That's, to me, it means level one trauma center, right? Neurosurgeon, MRI, CT scanner, physiatrist, trauma rehab specialist, a whole gamut of physical and occupational therapy, speech therapy, very expensive, very big facility, hard to reproduce at the community hospital level. Does that mean that patients who don't have access to a trauma center within the first 30 minutes or ideally within the first 10 minutes of their injury should receive less care? No, it does not. Here's a picture of Kandahar Airfield. Please uh, don't pay attention to the brown porta potty in the back. That slogan is true, best care anywhere. So rule three, to catch you up on some of the vernacular in the military medical system, is analogous to a level one trauma center. We had neurosurgeons, CT scanners, interventional radiology, even an MRI. And I was amazed when we put an MRI here because the two things that MRI doesn't like is dust and vibration. It's a helicopter base. <laughs> Lots of vibration. But that's true. Best care anywhere. I don't have a hard time delivering on our mission of anywhere, anytime, anything at Kandahar Airfield. What about Taran Cow? Taran Cow is in southern Afghanistan in Helmand Province. It's a role two. It's analogous to a community hospital. Comes equipped with one surgeon, one anesthesiologist, or if I have a British team, anesthetist. I just worked with them. That's, that's, that's awesome the way they say it, anesthetist. One emergency physician, orthopod, and a handful of nurses from the critical care realm and some, uh, some medics and the security element. We had about 60 units of, of blood, packed red blood cells and fresh filter plasma on hand at any given time. We can support, without doing walk-in blood bank, maybe two casualties with a massive transfusion. Can I deliver the best care anywhere here? I absolutely can. Because it comes down to principles and practice. The principles are the same, right? The principles are you have to deliver the best care possible with what you have on hand. The practices is how you do it. At a level one trauma center or at a roll three facility, we have all the amenities. We got this almost an unlimited blood bank. We have every subspecialty in trauma uh, or medicine that's available right now. But we have to change how we do our principles, I'm sorry, we have to, how we do our practices to match the environment that we're given. Because I can't go to the general, and more importantly, I can't go to mothers and fathers and say, listen, I'm sorry, but uh, when your son was injured or your daughter was injured, they came to Tarrant Cow which is a rule two, you know, we don't have all the amenities. We tried our best. Uh, we did what we were supposed to do, uh, but it just didn't work. We have to figure this out. I can get people out of Terran Cow if I got air assets, and the Army does a fantastic job with dust off, which is uh, the medevac platform in theater, of moving patients from point of injury uh, or a rule two to a rule three or higher echelon of care. Just to give you an idea of the landscape we're talking about, this is not a small area. So this is in the valley of Afghanistan, in the southern part. There's uh, mountains to the east, mountains to the west. But it's a huge landmass. And to put you in perspective, Kandahar Airfield is over here uh, on the uh, western part of Afghanistan. So you're saying, OK, that's fine. Helicopters can fly. Uh, that's not a big deal. Anybody know what that is? It's a sandstorm. So these are pretty common in Iraq and Afghanistan. And when they come in, sand goes into everything. And since uh, we cannot plan for this, sometimes we can, uh, but sometimes they just show up, sand will get into the rotors of the helicopter, get into the engine of the helicopter, then it has to go through a period of maintenance. Air goes to red or air goes to black, which means we're not flying. So if we sustain casualties and they're sitting in the Friss STP, forward resuscitated surgical suite, shock trauma platoon, they're going to sit there for a little while until we can either get them out or we resuscitate them. We don't really have a choice. This is where we are. Do you guys have any similar problems like this? 
Here's a picture of High Point State Park in Sussex County. Got some dense, near double canopy, some in some places triple canopy forest. Any medevac platforms here have a jungle penetrator that they can drop a, uh, a, a hoist system down and uh, pull that patient out? One. And U.S. Coast Guard, if they're available, right? But that's not your only problem. So to your northwest and to your center uh, south, you've got some pretty dense vegetation. You've got some pretty long transports. You have very similar problems logistically with getting your trauma patients to definitive care. All right, so why does the U.S. military care about this integration of military and civilian trauma? I'm going to give you four answers, okay? Number one, it's the law. So in 2017, uh, every year, the House Armed Services Committee and the Senate Armed Services Committee meet and they discuss uh, what military benefits are going to look like for the next year. In 2017, there were some pretty dramatic changes to the military health care system. The reform of military health care uh, was the beginning of this movement. We do a great job of taking care of folks. However, when we're in garrison care back here in the United States, our primary mission uh, or focus is readiness. And what readiness means is you get your health assessment done, you get your shots done, and we're also doing good primary care. Trauma care wasn't as important as it is today years ago. Uh, we did not have military trauma centers. The Army has a bunch of military trauma centers with one level one in San Antonio, but the Navy had none. Uh, and the Air Force primarily puts their folks who do, do acute care medicine like trauma in civilian hospitals that are busy, like Birmingham, Alabama, um, and shock trauma in Baltimore, and University of Cincinnati. This law asked us to create more trauma centers where applicable. It didn't say that we should take all military hospitals and convert them to trauma centers. It said we should have the capability of doing good trauma care. But this was a fundamental change. These certain civilians, this, these two words here, changed our mission to military medicine. Because my job as a military physician is to take care of persons wearing similar clothes as I am right now. It doesn't say I'm supposed to take care of civilians. It does say I'm supposed to resuscitate them if they're an extremist, but it doesn't say I'm supposed to open our gates to everybody. This was the idea. Build more trauma centers wherever available. Did anybody see the after action report from Las Vegas? The overarching message was that trauma care was in the dark. They, they had a real hard time moving all of these trauma patients to appropriate facilities. And in response, community hospitals stood up makeshift trauma centers. They brought all their surgeons in, and they said, we can receive trauma patients. And the Veterans Health Administration, the VA, which often has a lot of red tape, actually said, we're opening our doors. If you, we good? We're opening our doors. If you have patients that need to come here, preferably medical patients, we're willing to accept. I have never seen that before in my entire career. Trying to get into a military hospital without benefits is, is impossible, especially a VA hospital. This was the beginning of integration of military and civilian health care with the VA accepting medical patients. The NDA also told us to go out and train with hospitals and systems that are routinely busy in trauma care. So level one and level two and even level three trauma centers. How does that affect you? I should be putting our corpsmen on your ambulances in Newark and in Camden and in Trenton and in all the other highly populated urban areas that see a fair amount of penetrating trauma so that when we have to go to war tonight, they're ready and their last patient with a gunshot wound to the abdomen or the chest or the head was yesterday, not five years ago. It also said that we should start learning from each other. So I should learn from your trauma surgeons and your emergency physicians, and you should learn from our trauma surgeons and our emergency physicians, and we shouldn't have two silos operating independently. Because when I first came into military, they said, you can't, now, you can't make uh, military trauma and civilian trauma the same thing. They're, they're just totally different wounding patterns. Well, Las Vegas said that's not true. Boston said that's not true. A ton of other incidents said that's not true. So we're starting to see this integration, this very similar wounding mechanism 
and injuries sustained between your patients and my patients. All right, so why Medical Center Camp Lejeune? This is the newest uh, medical center in the Navy. For, for one, we have a distance problem. This is a schematic of the map uh, surrounding the area. Camp Lejeune sits right here in Onslow County, right on the water. Everything that is shaded is a one hour transport by ground. Everything with a circle represents a 20 minute flight. It's approximately a 45 minute flight from our hospital to the level one trauma center and approximately a 20 minute flight to a level two trauma center to our south. So the area in red is the level one trauma center and the area in yellow slash green is a level two trauma center. We have an inherent requirement. Here's four incidents that actually happened uh, within the last three years on board Camp Lejeune. The CH-53 was a hard landing. It actually made the news, the national news on Fox. Um, we had a gentleman, if you were at the talk yesterday from Master Chief Baker, who was spy rigging. Uh, they lost their tail rotor, put the aircraft into an uncontrolled spin. This uh, gentleman attached to the spy rig actually slammed against the fuselage and resulted in the aircraft landing on him. He had complex polytrauma. We requested a civilian helicopter to transport him to a trauma center because we were a community hospital. No civilian helicopter was available. So the decision to make a hasty medevac with an MV-22, and he was brought to our uh, emergency department in PEA arrest. Unfortunately, he sustained uh, life or, or uh, fatal injuries and uh, was not able to be resuscitated. Let's go a little bit less dramatic. We had a motor vehicle accident on base. Again, April, raining, wind, unfavorable for flight. Five patients are brought into the emergency department of a community hospital. One patient has a huge mesenteric rent in her abdomen with active bleeding, arterial bleeding. Pressures are declining, she's tachycardic, she's in gross hemorrhagic shock. There's no way we're getting this patient to a level one trauma center, even a level two trauma center. We take the patient to the OR, we stabilize her abdomen, she makes a full recovery. I have a transport problem. Currently, I have four helicopters that service our area. This is Airlink from New Hanover, East Care from Vidant, UNC Air Care, and Duke Life Flight. But if you are on Camp Lejeune between the months of April to October, November, we have a thunderstorm pretty much every afternoon. So in response to this, we now have an interfacility transfer team, a mobile intensive care unit that can handle a complex trauma patient and drive them the hour and 45 minutes from a level one trauma center after they have been resuscitated both medically and surgically. Here's the most important part about why we have to do this. These are not routine patients. These are my brothers and sisters, your sons and daughters, your children, your, your, your parents, your brothers. We owe it to the folks who put on the cloth of the nation to give them the absolute best chance of survival and lower their mortality and morbidity as much as possible. This is my first deployment to Iraq in 2007. This was uh, prior to going outside the wire. Um, we have our truck set up for a convoy here. Um, as you can see, there's no uh, magazine in the uh, magazine well of this rifle. Um, it's all fun and games, it's pretty exciting. Then we get to the clearing barrel. The clearing barrel is basically where you, it's like the amnesty barrel. Uh, you have to download your weapon or upload your weapon. And this is right before you go outside the wire. Here's a shot inside the Humvee. Little did we know that despite nightly poker games and visits to uh, Iraqi dignitaries and sheik's houses trying to establish goodwill, uh, that we would take a significant number of casualties uh, following a firefight in January of 20, 2008. So here's one of the casualties that was uh, critically wounded. This was a, at a soccer game, and uh, he was basically just standing patrol or uh, exercising a, a guard, and an uh, insurgent walked up with a suicide vest, detonated the vest, approximately three or four feet in front of him. To make a long story short, it ended this way. 
This was, I was a doctor for 15 months. This was my first combat, or my first deployment. And this was my first exposure to complex blast injury and, and loss of life. This gentleman had no chance. But if he had a chance at survival, we should have given it to him. At this, at this stage of the game, we did not know all the lessons because we were still early in the war. And this was the nidus for me to get involved in this thing. We're going to fast forward now by almost a decade. Unfortunately, I initially had the gentleman who was on this case uh, presenting this keynote speech. Uh, he is now in Afghanistan on, I don't know, his 11th deployment. And he can't give you the speech. Uh, he cannot give you this case. But I'm going to do my best to do this case justice. Uh, I don't think you're ever going to hear another case as complex, as heroic, and as miraculous as this. So the time is sometime before dawn. This is a routine um, special operations, if there is such a thing as routine special operations patrol. There's a high value target that they are seeking. Pay attention to the ambient temperature. Negative six degrees Celsius, 20 degrees Fahrenheit. They're in a heavy, mountainous, steep slope with snow cover. Um, they make contact. One operator or assaulter is injured by an enemy combatant with small arms fire and also sustains a fragmentation wound from a hand grenade. There's two special operations medics available who respond with suppressive fire. This is a care under fire uh, tactic where good medicine is bad tactics. We don't want to stay on the X, we want to get off the X. So the idea is to do a rapid exfil, get them out and undercover, and then do a better idea. The initial blood sweep is negative. So run your hands from the head to toe, you're checking for sticky, you're, st you're checking for wet, it was negative. This casualty can now walk, but he is unsteady on his feet, but he is able to move himself. He's alert and oriented times four, and once they get him to a, period, a position of cover, they notice the frag wounds to his face, as well as several gunshot wounds to the anterior and posterior thorax, basically above the sappy plate. He receives a tourniquet applied to his axillary artery, which is ineffective because of the junctional hemorrhage location. He's then given hemostatic dressing to combat this axillary bleed, and he's given a unit of freeze-dried plasma. The patient also has a sucking chest wound, so he's given a vented chest seal, and underneath the vented chest seal is some combat gauze to try and tampon on some bleeding. He's got a absent breath sounds and evidence of tension physiology, so a needle decompression is conducted. In total, he receives seven angiocatheters to decompress this chest. His mental status begins to decline, and he becomes lethargic. His skin is cool and clammy, and he has an absent radio pulse. An 18-gauge IV is inserted, and a gram of TXA is infused. Freeze-dried plasma is prescribed. However, because of some logistical problems transfusing, it had to be administered through a 60 ml syringe with a filter needle. Following the freeze-dried plasma and the TXA, he regains his radio pulse, and his mental status improves. They make contact with their exfil, and MH-47 comes in with a uh, surgical team on board. You see his vital signs there, tachycardic, poor oxygen saturation, tachypnic, and poor perfusion with a 30 radio pulse. He's given a manual transfusion of warm packed red blood cells and a bilateral 14-gauge angiocath to improve his work of breathing. On the bird, he gets an ultrasound which is negative on the FAST, but does demonstrate bilateral pneumothoraces, or hemothoraces. Here's a schematic of his injuries. So just to give you a point of reference, the SAPI would cover this area right here, the shock plate. He sustained one directly above the SAPI and one lateral to the SAPI with additional wounds in the back and one in the axilla. Here's some current vital signs, blood pressure 85 over 40, shock physiology. 
The IV, of course, is lost. Also keep in mind, it is 20 degrees at the base, which means it's probably about five degrees in the air. A right CVL is placed, and the patient's given IV fentanyl, ketamine, and versed. The decision to place bilateral chest tubes is made, and he gets a right-sided thoracostomy tube with 400 milliliters of blood, and a left-sided with 200 milliliters of blood. The patient is intubated, and what happens when we intubate critically ill trauma patients? He goes into PA arrest. On board this MH-47, the surgical team opens his chest and does a resuscitative thoracotomy. The finichetto opens the left side of the chest. There's a large amount of uh, clotted blood, and there's also a huge rent in the uh, right lung that is actively bleeding. A GIA stapler, or gastrointestinal anastomosis stapler, is used to staple this lung wound, and the patient regains spontaneous circulation. Yes, they got ROSC in the back of an MH-47. Here's a picture of the casualty at Madigan Army Medical Center in Tacoma, Washington. And this is open source. You have, there's access to this journal. I'm going to let his commanding officer give you this case. Of course. I'm sorry, bear with me here. I'd like to begin today by sharing the story of an Army Ranger wounded just a few short weeks ago in eastern Afghanistan. His story is not only a testament to the bravery and skill of our Army Rangers, but to the amazing passion, creativity, and skill of Army medical professionals. Wounded on the objective of a high-value target, this sergeant, already the veteran of three deployments, was shot twice just above his ballistic plates. Immediately, the Ranger medic team performed life-saving first aid, controlling his bleeding and administering freeze-dried plasma. After a difficult exfil, flight medics aboard the MH-47 continued to stabilize Ranger Campbell. Using ultrasound in flight, identified another wound causing heavy bleeding. After a tail-to-tail -tail swap, a flight surgeon inserted two chest tubes. And after Ranger Camel went into traumatic arrest from loss of blood, he performed a thoracotomy, opening his entire left chest, again on an MH-47. Identifying a hemorrhage in his lung and surgically correcting it. After four minutes of traumatic arrest, Ranger Campbell regained his breathing and stabilized. This Ranger's story is amazing. There is not another army on the face of this planet that provides the same level of medical care to its warriors as ours does. These are the words of his commander, and I quote, this is a Ranger who is alive today thanks to the incredible teamwork and precision skill of all the medical team working on him that night. This is the most impressive casualty save I have ever heard of in a combat theater. End of quote. And I second that emotion. In your wildest imagination, can you ever imagine a pre-hospital thoracotomy with ROSC? I think that pretty much sums it up. So I did give this uh, 
this paper to uh, the conference staff. If you would like a copy, uh, I believe it will be available on the website. Uh, if you cannot get it on the website, please email me. I am happy to send it to you electronically. Let's talk about something else. So it's, we know what happens in the uh, developed theater of operations in Afghanistan and Iraq. Ranger Campbell's story is absolutely amazing. But what about at sea? We really can't replenish at sea, especially if you are in certain areas of the globe. It may be three or 400 miles between the next ship. So here's a case from the USS Bataan on their most recent Mediterranean deployment. A UH-60 Blackhawk is landing on board the ship and suffers a catastrophic failure. The aircraft ends up crashing on board the flight deck and general quarters is called. Six casualties with significant injuries to include one in traumatic arrest. The patient's then flown from that ship to another ship and requires resuscitative thoracotomy. Again, not in the air, but in the uh, trauma bay. There's patients with multiple pelvic fractures, with cervical spine fractures, and multiple comminuted open long bone fractures. Whole blood, again, comes into play. In total, 75 units of blood were transfused into these patients. 11 packed red blood cells, 10 fresh frozen plasma, 54 fresh whole blood plasma, or fresh whole blood units, 54. When we say fresh whole blood, it means pulling blood out of you, testing it, and giving it to him. Patient one gets nine units, three whole blood, two FFP, four pack red. Patient two gets five units of five whole blood. The most critical patient, the thoracotomy patient, gets 65 units, 45 whole blood, eight fresh frozen plasma, and 12 PRBCs. Who here is affiliated with a level one trauma center? How many thoracotomies have you seen walk out of the emergency department? Not walk out of the emergency department, walk out of the hospital. Here's two thoracotomies that are alive today and fully functionally ambulatory. One on the, in the deserts of Afghanistan and one on board the ship of the USS Bataan. I'm going to show you some excerpts from the after action report. This was from the senior medical officer on board the USS Bataan. Whole blood eventually became the resuscitation fluid of choice. All medical personnel were amazed with the response of whole blood. The consensus of all providers was that whole blood, without a doubt, saved lives. These folks would not be alive today without whole blood. Let's talk about teamwork and integration. It's not just the medical part that has to work well for this. The environment of care has to work well as, as well. So cold, coagulopathic, and acidotic, right? How do we combat the cold part? We raise up the ambient temperature. The operating room is basically fed by uh, uh, cold water called chill water. And they coordinate with the chief engineer on board the ship to shut down the chill water, raising the ambient temperature to 90 degrees. Here's proof positive that if you make your ORs warmer, the patient will do better. Synergy. There's three disparate teams on board the ship. There's the Frisk STP, there's the Fleet Surgical Team, and then there's the SOST team. Three separate operating units. All three came together and operated on one patient. They all knew what the left hand and right hand were doing because they trained together. Without three surgeons operating on this one patient, the thoracotomy patient dies. Can't work in silos, folks. We have to integrate. Any Pulp Fiction fans here? I don't agree. What happened here today was Navy medicine, and that is truly miraculous. All right, so we spent a lot of time talking about level one trauma centers. I'm not looking for a level one trauma center right now at Camp Lejeune. We're looking for a level three trauma center. Why a level three trauma center? Well, as we all know, we have the golden hour. The golden hour has been well publicized for probably about 40 years now. But more important than the golden hour is the platinum 10 minutes. And that means stopping bleeding and getting you to definitive or resuscitative care, not definitive care, but resuscitative care within 10 minutes. We talked about our logistical problems, and you, you know well about code, coagulopathic, and acidotic. But what about damage control resuscitation? 
The idea is that we minimize surgical time, we utilize a whole blood transfusion strategy because currently you cannot administer whole blood, uh, fresh whole blood. You can administer whole blood products, but you can't pull it out of one person, test it, and put it into another person. And then we respect the clot with permissive hypotension and tranexamic acid to avoid overfilling the tank and popping the clot. Why is that so important? Because if you have consumed all of your clotting factors, you're not gonna be able to make a new clot. So we basically get one chance at getting this right. What's the idea behind damage control resuscitation? This comes from the Navy. This is a Navy term from World War II. If you were hit with a torpedo on board your ship, you went to general quarters and they did damage control. The idea was to keep the ship afloat long enough until repairs, definitive repairs, could be made. Nobody at the water line is gonna go weld plates onto this ship, but we are gonna shut down hatches that are filling with water and try to keep the ship afloat and prevent it from sinking. The same principles apply to damage control resuscitation and damage control surgery. Permissive hypotension, keeping the pressure at the lowest perfusible possibly number. Positive radial pulse, mental status intact, systolic blood pressure at or close to 90. It's different for everybody. Older folks are gonna require a little bit higher pressure. Younger folks can tolerate a little bit lower pressure. If you follow me on Facebook, I recently figured out that I was allergic to fire ants. I know what a blood pressure of 70 feels like. It sucks. But I also know that I was conscious, awake, and alert with a blood pressure of 70, and I knew exactly what was going on. Hemostatic resuscitation. Before, we would transfuse some packed red blood cells, and we would give two units, four units, six units, eight units, 10 units. Okay, now we gotta add some plasma. Okay, let's add two units. All right, four units. Okay, now we gotta add a little bit of platelets. Okay, and this would go on for like six or seven hours and our casualties would die and we would say, I don't know why. Because what they're bleeding out is not just red cells, it's not just plasma, it's not just platelets, it's everything. So we gotta start from the beginning and give them what they're losing immediately. But we gotta give them just enough until we can get in there and stop the bleeding. And once the bleeding is stopped, that's when definitive care comes into play. That's when everybody gets to a level one trauma center. But in the interim, where we are located in Camp Lejeune, we don't have that access to a level one trauma center. We need to be able to do this and do it well. So what has the military medicine given the civilians in the last 15 years? We talked about tourniquets. We talked about fresh whole blood. We talked about TXA. We talked about freeze-dried plasma. We have given damage control resuscitation. This was a civilian concept that was emphasized for its importance in the last 15 years. Dr. Rotondo actually came up with the idea of DCR and put it into play at Vidant Medical Center in Greenville. But the success of DCR has been seen in this conflict over the last 15 years. Who doesn't get DCR? I mean, there's relative contraindications, but ideally if they have a head injury, and if the head injury is the most significant injury, then you wanna keep that pressure above 90, ideally closer to 110, because we wanna avoid hypotension. However, if the head injury is in addition to exsanguinating abdominal or thoracic trauma, that patient still gets DCR. We're trying to avoid clot rupture. We're trying to prevent coagulopathy, and we're trying to prevent hypothermia. Who here puts a uh, heat blanket on all of your trauma patients routinely? Outstanding. To summarize DCR, the patients should show up to a level one trauma center warm, pink, moist, and sticky. If we get warm, pink, moist, and sticky, we're doing great. If we can do it well at Naval Medical Center Camp Lejeune with DCR, then we can do it well anywhere. And this is a readiness problem. This is a readiness platform. We are building this trauma center at Lejeune so that when we have to go tonight, we're ready to go. And it hasn't been five or 10 years since our last deployment and we saw trauma. Why is this important to us? because we owe it to the United States of America and the people wearing the cloth of the nation 
to bring as many people home alive and vertical as possible. If you have never been a part of a homecoming for a unit, there is nothing like it. To see signs like this and to know that you had a hand in that, there is nothing more important in your life. And that's our mission, and that's why this is critically important. And you guys are tremendously valuable in helping us achieve this mission because you have plenty to teach and you have plenty to offer as far as skills, as far as experience. So if there is ever a way that you can get involved in this integration of military and civilian trauma, I implore you, please, consider it, help us, so that we can do this again. It's been my honor and my privilege to give this talk today on Veterans Day on the 242nd birthday of the United States Marine Corps. I thank you very much for your time and attention, and I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you again. Any questions? I'm getting off easy. Usually I get like a thousand questions about TCR. I'm sorry? Uh, with the trauma patient uh, involving the helicopter, I'm just wondering who usually staffs those types of helicopters? So dust off is uh, staffed by Army medics, um, and they have a training program in San Antonio. Uh, so they integrate well. Uh, the city of San Antonio is like half military, well, probably like three quarters military and a quarter of civilians. Uh, and as you saw from the, uh, the most recent incident uh, with the shooting in the church, a good number of the patients went to University Hospital in San Antonio, but a lot of patients went to San Antonio uh, Arm or Military Medical Center. And um, they have a training program for flight medics on board uh, SAMC or, or San Antonio Military Medical Center uh, that vets these guys. They do a fantastic job of in route care. Um, some of the other platforms that we have, uh, the PJs from the Air Force, Special Operations Paramedics, and uh, they actually have their own show course, uh, and you can see exactly what they do. Um, I mean, I can tell you right now, our medics are fantastic. Um, when it comes to geriatric uh, ACS and mesenteric ischemia, you know, they're, they're going to stumble a little bit. It hasn't been childbirth. There's not a single special operations medic, am I right, Master Chief, who is like all geared up to deliver a baby, right? But if you're hit, that's the guy that you want. Anything else? Guys can't let me off that easy. Usually it's at least three questions, so. Sir. Yep, yep, so hemostatic agents uh, probably have um, some mortality, morbidity benefit. The problem is, is proving it. The tourniquets are definitely provable, uh, but the hemostatic agents, no doubt, uh, play a role, especially in the junctional hemorrhage. Um, are you guys carrying hemostatics on all your ambulances? Awesome. Awesome. Yep. Yep. So um, I wish I could answer that question because uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna let you guys in on a little uh, little information. We have a, a chief at our at our place who was recently critically injured in a uh, motor vehicle accident, and uh, she went to a community hospital before she went to the level one trauma center. This was north of the base. Uh, it would not have been reasonable to bring her to us. It would have been probably close to an hour for her to come to us. But uh, when she got there, she got a little bit of blood. She didn't get the prescribed amount of blood. She had a hemothorax. She didn't get a chest tube. Um, she uh, had a pelvic fracture. She didn't get a pelvic binder. Um, she got some crystalloid fluid, which to us is like uh, basically just giving death. Um, you know, there was things 
that folks are trying to do, because how many physicians in the audience right now? Emergency physicians. Where'd you train? Okay. Which, which one? Okay. Uh, your trauma rotation. Level one trauma center? Yep. How many physicians have trained at a level three trauma center? But we don't know, we don't know, right? So our training is, you go to a level one trauma center, it's the highest acuity, you got all the services, and this is what trauma is. And that's where the box is. And the box never gets any bigger because we're focused on what a level one trauma center does. If you don't know what a level three trauma center, it's like trying to explain what an elephant is to a blind man. Okay, that's the trunk. Okay, I got that. Okay, that's the tail. How are they connected? I don't know because I can't get my arms around the whole elephant. Um, and that's what we're really trying to do is put the value of a level three trauma center, a community trauma center that does resuscitative care in the mindset of the civilian world and show the value of how a level three trauma center contributes to reducing morbidity and mortality because it's the same exact lessons that we saw at Taran Cow, at Ramadi, at Fallujah, where we didn't have a, level, a role three. Does that make sense? All right, that was three questions, so I guess I'm done. <laughs> Again, thank you very much for having me. I, uh, I'm a New Jersey native, uh, 20 years in EMS here. Uh, it is absolutely my honor to uh, deliver this talk today. Thanks again.